Okay. Good afternoon. Um, and in case you're wondering where you've walked into, you've walked into DevOps the Next Generation. Um, and a quick warning, uh, it is meme and Star Trek heavy. Um, if that is a problem for anybody. Um, <laughs> so, a uh, little bit about me. Uh, my name is Barney Hanlon. I am a technical team leader at Invika. Um, and you can catch me on Twitter at Shrikey. Um, and about Invika, we're hiring. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about DevOps. Um, DevOps has been going on for a while. It's a new field. You see a lot more adverts for recruiting DevOps. Um, so first there were sysadmins who their job is to make sure that things stay the same. Things don't fall over. Uh, and then there are developers, of course, who are about making new stuff happen, um, which means that they're diametrically opposed. Um, and then we have this new field of DevOps. Um, now, probably everybody in this room has done a small amount of DevOps. The smallest amount you can possibly do is getting the code on the server. Um, and that's been happening for a, quite a long period of time. Um, first it was FTP, then was CBS, because we thought maybe we're a bit bored of overwriting each other's changes. Um, then we thought, well, actually, we like, we like branching problems. We really want to have trouble merging codes, so we'll do subversion. Uh, and then we got a bit tired of that, and we thought, actually, we quite like branching, so we're going to go with Git, new and improved. Um, but that's not really DevOps. Um, there's all this other stuff in DevOps. Setting up virtual hosts, SSH access, or MOSH, if you are new and cool, uh, log rotation, staging servers, build pipelines, SSL certificates, minification, user management, file permissions, firewall rules, patching, concurrency, failover, and alerting. Um, as developers, we need to know more than how to just push commits to GitHub. Um, and I like to think of these as five-star DevOps. And when I talk about five-star DevOps, I'm not talking about um, five-star or uh, Cassiopeia, five stars with the constellation there. Some of, don't know if anybody's old enough to remember five star the first time around. Um, the five stars of DevOps. Um, monitoring is probably the most important one for, for a lot of people. Uh, security, performance, automation, and scalability. Um, this is a question I ask myself when I'm setting up an application. It may be Drupal, Silex, Symfony, whatever it might be. Am I doing something in my application that is done better by the infrastructure or an external service? Probably. Um, before we go too far on this, though, we should talk about do's and don'ts. Um, I don't like people logging into my server. I don't like to log into my server. Um, there's a couple of reasons why people log on. You hear this a lot. Um, just recently with a client, um, I needed to check something in Apache logs. Well, first off, I said, why are you using Apache instead of Nginx? But um, they said, oh, they need privs. They, they can't go in. They have to go and sudo and read the logs. Um, uh, the directories are, for some reason, Apache couldn't write to this folder, so I had to go in and tweak that. Um, and, of course, if things go wrong, then you have to require going in and restarting the process. Um, so let's get rid of the first one. Um, monitoring. Um, now, if you are in a situation where your CEO comes to you and he says, she says, what is going on in the server? Why are we having downtime? And you go... There's a problem we don't know. You do not have sufficient logging. It's that simple. Um, you should log pretty much everything you can. Um, but we're here talking about Drupal today. Drupal 7 was notorious for this. Um, if you switched on visitor logging, it's going to use the database. 
Um, and there's a question with that. Should you be using... I should change this, actually. Should you be using your application database to log visits? No. It's your application. Your marketing director may go, no, it's really important, I know how many people are on the site. That's not what your application is for. Um, so, let's talk a little bit more about that. Firstly, when I say monitoring, logging is only one part of monitoring. Um, and we don't want these in our database anymore, so we can send our web logs to remote service. Um, and that's achievable by changing your php.ini, so it says error log syslog. And now, we can then send it to a remote service. Splunkstorm wins the name for the best name, um, but there's a couple of others. There's Logly, uh, Log Entries, and Paper Trail App. Paper Trail App's more popular with audit people, um, but you can search it. It's got query-based logging. Um, if you prefer to roll your own, you can use Splunk, it's the, free, the open source version. Uh, Greylog2, uh, Sensu's my particular favourite. Uh, Munin, which is quite good for aggregation, giving you an idea of tracking over, over time. And Raven. Raven has a client called Sentry, which gives you exceptions. More important than Drupal 8, where things are more uh, throwing exceptions rather than just fataling or whatever it might be. Um, but as I said before, there's more to monitoring than logging. So Nagios lets you know that your site's up or, more importantly, your services are up. There's Pingdom, lets you know how your site's doing generally. Uh, New Relic, tells you how PHP's doing, also has plugins for Varnish. Um, and in terms of knowing how many people are on the site, this PIWIC and Google Analytics. PIWIC has a Drupal 7 module. It's quite good. Um, code itself, wow. Um, but there's other things. Monitoring and logging tell you what happened. You probably want to get involved before something goes wrong. Um, so profiling. Um, now my personal favorite is XHProf. It's got XH GUI and it's fairly light. Um, people may remember, hands up actually, who's ever turned on XDebug in live? How did that work out for you? Okay, right. Um, it's not such an issue in XHProf, certainly if you're load balancing. You can go in, see how it's doing, switch it off if you see a problem. Um, users don't care about that stuff, though. Um, so the thing that you should be looking at more than anything is something like Google Developer Tools. How's your site actually downloading, getting to your customer? Are they getting those assets fast enough? Is, is there any other bottleneck? Because that's really what a user cares about. Um, and you should be using opco caching. So we're going to check APC, see if there's too much fragmentation there. Um, so, all right, we've now stopped people logging onto our box to check Apache, which isn't the best way to do it with grep anyway. Um, let's talk a little bit more about security generally, because you're all moving into an area where you guys want to take over this, because if you don't, somebody else will do it for you. And if they're a sysadmin, they won't care about your application. Um, so the risks are your application security. Um, nothing I'm going to talk about today is going to help you if you write yourself a SQL injection attack. Sorry, that's outside DevOps. Um, but I can help a little bit with infrastructure security and end user security. Um, so we'll cover infrastructure security. Um, if you put up a website today, uh, just a server in fact, and put in a fairly strong password with root on port 22 and log, it's pretty interesting how many people in China and Russia want to have a quick look around your box for you. Um, so we can mitigate against some of this. Um, I wasted two hours of my life last week. Um, three developers joined on the client side. Barney, go and put them up on the servers. SSH keys into groups. 15 servers. So I went round and had some manually 
add this SSH key and the groups and the user accounts. It's two hours of my life I'm not going to get back. Um, so I started looking into Jump Cloud. Now, Jump Cloud's a daemon. You install it on the server. gives you a control panel inside jumpcloud.com. And you can turn off and on your users there with no need for any sort of DevOps knowledge whatsoever. Um, put in their SSH key, what group you want them in, job done. They leave in a hurry, you can pull their SSH key and it's off of all of your servers within about 10 seconds. I timed it, I wanted to tell, you know, if it's going to take half an hour, is that going to fail the PCI or whatever. Um, the next one after that is Duo Security. Duo Security is two factor and Google Authenticator has been around for a while but it's on your system account. So with Geo Security, it's another remote service, another daemon, and it works with SSH access. Normally, with something like Google Two-Factor, um, you, if you connect via SSH key, PAM's ignored. So you're just going, all right, well, there's SSH key, and then I'll reinforce sudo. Geo Security, it actually blocks at SSH. So, aha, I get in with my SSH key, my phone pings. Are you trying to log into this server? And I click approve on their app, and it will let me in, or deny it. Um, the other one that people forget is just access control lists. Um, it's a bit of an anti-pattern. I see this a, a couple of times where I have to add myself to the www data group so I can look in a file or a, a folder. I'm not a server, I'm not a, a web server, I'm having to add myself to this. This is an anti-pattern, really. With ACLs, these get round the issue of one group can do one thing. You can add on additional ones for using set ACL and get ACL. Um, problem is, is that uh, two-factor breaks films. Um, but I can live with that. Um, so, okay, we've got a fairly stronger infrastructure now, and we're not actually having to do that much work. So let's now concentrate on our users. Um, SSL. It's been in the news an awful lot, thanks to a guy who's now in Russia. Um, and so we'd like to harden it, right? No. Don't bother hardening SSL. Um, it's more about clarification than anything. Um, SSL is long gone, or should be long gone. It's all now about transport layer security, TLS, um, and the latest version of 1.2. Um, it's much of an improvement over SSL. Uh, secure socket layer is, well, it's got some weaknesses, and we'll go into those. Um, TLS itself is not invulnerable. Uh, there's the beast attack, the crime attack, my favourite name, the Lucky 13 attack, which um, all of these work on the fact that some ciphers are not ideal. They're not as random as we would like, and so they can actually decrypt the session cookie. So they can hijack your cookie. Hijack your session, sorry. If there's any trackies here, I'd be well impressed if they can remember the shield frequency? No? Shameful. Um, okay, so why is it important to talk about ciphers? Well, um, a lot of people go, they download Apache, Nginx, and they see the example in the nginx.conf or the default ssl.conf, and they go, all right, I'm going to implement that. <coughs> So let's take a look at Nginx one, okay? All right, that's out of the box. We've gone to 1310 on Monday. Okay. It's open to the lucky 13 attack because it's using RC4, which is uh, the weakness there. It's not as perfect as we had liked. Everybody thought RC4 was brilliant because it overcomes the beast attack. Unfortunately, it's open to lucky 13. Um, the other thing there is it's supporting SSL v3. And the only reason you need that is if you support IE6. So get rid of it, please. Um, 
All right, well, that's not too bad. Let's now take a look at Apaches. Hmm. Everyone see that? <laughs> that's not great. Um, all right, well, why are we worrying about this? Well, there's a nice quote from Ivan Ristik on Qualys. Today, only TLS 1.2 with GCM suites offer fully robust security. All other suites suffer from one problem or another, uh, but mostly difficult to exploit in practice. He then goes on to say in a later blog post that cybercrime is improving in its uh, technological proficiency. So what we'll see is a lowering in beast attacks and more people trying Lucky 13. Because GCM suites are not yet widely supported, most communication today is carried out using one of the slightly flawed cipher suites. It is not possible to do better if you're running a public website. I don't like that either. Um, well, there is something that can help, and there's the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, it comes in two flavours, DH and ECDH. Um, and the main thing is it allows for perfect forward secrecy. Perfect forward secrecy is the idea that you separate out the difference between authentication and encryption. Um, in other suites, what happens is that the same cipher is used to authenticate you and encrypt your data. So if you were to monitor some site's traffic for two years, for example, and then you recovered the private key through social engineering or whatever manner, then you're in the situation where they've got all of your previous communications and they can decrypt it. With perfect forward secrecy, that's not possible. It's a one-time thing per request and response. Um, the problem is that Diffie-Hellman is kind of slow. Um, so you don't see people favour it. Um, well, I did some trawling around and I was interested in this, so I uh, don't know if you can see this particularly well, but this is my cut down Nginx and that's quite a long cipher suite, but we'll go through it and all the things that we're going on here. So the first one that we're doing is we're adding a strict transport security header. Now this basically says I'm not going to accept HTTP traffic on this port. I'm just going to talk about HTTPS. Um, okay, that's good. But now it's a bit slow, so what we want to do is cache the session. This reduces the, ha the uh, handshake overhead for a, for a cipher. Um, possibly the most important thing here is prefer server ciphers on. Now this says, thanks browser, you, you like the fast ones. That's cool. I don't. I like the secure ones. So you, we're going to pick them in my order. And then where we agree, that's where we go in. And so the order is important. Uh, SSL protocols, you see that we've removed SSL v3. I don't like the idea of people with IE6 connecting to my site. It feels dirty. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, and now here is this massively long site thing. But as you can see, it's ECDH first and AES GCM. So ideally, if I can give you perfect forward secrecy without flaw, I will. DH, again, it may be slower, but it's also unflawed. And then we depreciate down until, well, we get to a point whereby it's secure, but it's your fault. Get a better browser. Um, and then we change the curve used by you. I will go into that at the break if anyone wants to talk to me about SSL ECDH curve. I had to read quite a bit about it. I still have a headache. Um, a good place to start is testing the strengths of what you currently have. Um, SSLlabs.com, you can give it a domain and test and try and get an A grade. If you don't, think about it. Um, okay, but now we've changed the cipher. Um, I don't mind that the site is slow, at least my data is safe. <laughs> no user ever said has said that. that. <laughs> so we need to talk about performance. Um, and who could be more performant than Jean-Luc Picard? Um, the first thing is, the thing we've talked about is, so we should probably talk about speedy. Who's heard of speedy? 
Good. More hands than I had hoped for. That's good. Um, so it's draft HTTP2. Um, the nice thing at the moment is that with Nginx, it is now no longer a patch, although they do support an older version of Speedy. I think they support version 2 and version 3.1 is the draft. You say you might be more knowledgeable on that if it is 3.1. Okay, no problem. Um, the nice thing about it is that it allows multiplexing with a single connection. There is this anti-pattern, which we've all done, where we go, all right, well, we're connecting to example.org, um, and there's this RFC that says we're allowed to have four connections. So we've got all of these images and JavaScript and so forth, so we're going to put them on um, either a vanity domain or a CDN. Probably if it's a CDN, fine, I can understand it. If it's the same server, then you're just basically trying to get around the RFC. Um, but each one of those connections has a TCP overhead. So this is a multiplexing technology that allows you to use one connection. Um, and it requires HTTPS. Draft HTTP 2 doesn't, but Speedy does, so I like it. Um, now, if you've got the right site, do you even need HTTP? I've run sites myself whereby I just forward all traffic on 80 to 443 and run Speedy. If you do enough tweaking, what's the point? Because most application bugs to do with switching protocols. Why are you switching protocols at that point? Why are you going, oh, right, this site's HTTP, and look around. Oh, but you now need to log in, so we'll now move you on to HTTPS. And then you want to look around the rest of the site again, which is all anonymous, but now you've got a session cookie, so it's not quite right, so now you're seeing uncached stuff. This is unnecessary. So move to HTTPS if you can. Um, but you might go, all right, that's quite slow and so forth. Well, we have another friend in this called PageSpeed. Um, I particularly like PageSpeed. I've been with PageSpeed for a while. Um, it's a library for Apache and Nginx. Um, and it's out beta now, actually. Yes, it's a 1.x release on Nginx as well. Um, the nice thing about it, people go, all right, well, I use the minified version of jQuery. I use the minified version of Twitter Bootstrap. Um, you don't need to. Let a C library do it for you. Let a C library that can also collapse all the white space. There was a talk this morning on um, Twig. The gentleman there, who's sitting in the front row, mentioned about white space. And I was thinking, it's a problem that goes away with page speed, because I can collapse all of the white space on a page. And you might go, all right, well, that's saving me a couple of bytes. But we're getting more traffic going via mobile. So that's bytes in the wire savings. Um, and it can detect what type of user you are. So if you have Chrome, you have a, uh, a format called WebP. It's an image format that's more efficient than PNG and JPEG. Um, now, if you're on Firefox, you don't care about WebP. <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, but PageSpeed can go, ah, Chrome, hey, how are you doing? I'm just going to compress this image into WebP, cache that locally, and then give you the WebP image. So again, more bytes saved. Um, so I came up with a solution, uh, which I've been writing about, um, and because it's got some good results, but I don't know if it's for everybody, but we'll talk about it anyway. Um, so at the front, facing you, the user, I have Nginx. Um, then I have Varnish behind it. Then I have Nginx again, and then I have PHP FPM. Hmm, seems a little over the top. Well, what's going on? Okay, so the first Nginx is the SSL termination and provides speed, uh, which Varnish can't. Uh, but it's also got access to the dot group. So if you ask for an image, I'm just going to give it to you. Nginx can give you an image generally go away and benchmark yourself faster than Varnish can pull it out of RAM because Nginx can cache the file handles. It's running like Linux will cache file handles. Ask for the same image three or four times, see which one's faster. Nginx is probably going to win. Uh, and it can do gzipping for you. So now you see in Varnish files, uh, this, if it's this, I want to do this and I want to do that. Turn that all off. Just let one 
layer deal with that. Now my cache in Varnish is only going to deal with un uh, gzip content. And PageSpeed itself, as I said, is user aware, so I can give you the right version. Um, so Varnish is now responsible for caching only dynamic pages. In fact, I have an advantage now, because when I look in Varnish log, I know that whatever I saw in there is a 404 from the front. Has to be. Otherwise, Nginx would have given it to you. It's a nice feeling. Um, and it can normalize some cookies some further. Further. In fact, I find cookie normalization in Varnish is better than in Nginx, um, but there are some gotchas with it. Um, and then, of course, the back Nginx is doing the actual serving of dynamic content. Um, and I also give it generic page speed optimizations in there. So I will do collapsing white space. That is not something that's going to have any advantage on the forward Nginx. Um, some people would prefer that switched off? Up to you. I quite like the idea that what's in Varnish is already pre-optimized so that I don't have to run page speed again. And finally, PHPF fit again, which is acting as your interpreter. So we, um, there is a gotcha, of course, because that works nicely for anonymous content. Um, cookies. <coughs> cookies do annoy people um, because they break caching layers. Um, the set cookie in Varnish game over most of the time. Um, here's an example, cross-site request forgery. Um, you see this in Drupal forms all the time, actually, that they put in a token. It's an OWASP recommendation. Oh, sorry, I should correct this slide, because it's not a recommendation of OWASP that you should go and do cross-site request <laughs> forgery. Um, but the idea is that you put a token in the form and you put a corresponding token in the session, the two match up, but it does break most reverse proxies. Um, so let's go back to our earlier thing. Am I doing something in my application that has done better? Well, anything that we do at the PHP level, we're going to break varnish. If we're doing a truly random token, uh, we could do maybe some tricking around with JavaScript, but actually it's JavaScript that's generally the problem that we're trying to get around with CSRF. So, I did some research into this last year and I came across OpenResty. Uh, OpenResty is an Nginx bundle. Um, it has modules for connecting to Redis, Drizzle, a couple of others. Um, and then, importantly, it has the Lua module. Um, now, Lua is a very lightweight language, C based, um, and really quite fast, what it does. So, we're going to do a simplified example. Um, I looked last night in. Drupal 8 and came across, uh, well, I, tried, I had, had a go at it. It's been six months since I last looked in this particular file. Things have moved on a little bit um, in one direction in some things. But anyhow, uh, I create an interface and then what I'm doing is I'm just putting in a token. It's not random. It's going to say something like insert CSRF here. And then I change the massive form builder. So it's going to accept the interface. Okay, well, what's going to happen then? Well, we're now going to use it the fact that OpenResty has Lewis and, Re and uh, Lua and Redis together. Um, so PHP FPM is now going to send a header, XCSRF tokenize, and there's our token, which gets cached and varnished because we're not setting a cookie. And then OpenResty goes, ah, I've received that header. I should probably then fire up my regex, find the token, and then replace it with a real token. This is what Lua looks like. I don't know if you can see all of that, but I'm, in a little bit I'll give you the gist if you want to uh, take a look. But effectively, we can find if we're getting this response from the back end, and then decide if we're going to do something about it. Um, and we create a random cookie, and we store the HMAC uh, as a value in Redis, um, generate the cookie with a uh, Redis key. There's a bit more code for you. <coughs> I quite like Lua. It's nice, easy to read. It's a swine to get documentation on it. But, um, we then communicate on the way back. We can now check in Redis if that key value exists. 
and we are the right side of our caching layer. It's a post back, but I can deal with it with OpenResty if I choose to. Um, and I can send a simple 403 back if I wish to and just say, look, you've posted, something's up, deal with it. And I can have a 403 page in Nginx to take care of that. Um, if you want the full gist, it's here, and I'll put it in the notes when I put it up on SlideShare. Um, let's move on to automation. Um, a lot of talking about tooling today, um, which is good. Um, when you start with tooling, this is generally where people start. It's okay. It's, I mean, it's Marcus Deglos did a talk, I think, two years ago um, on the subject of how bastards were the wrong way of doing things. I can understand that if you are starting in this direction, it's better to have something rather than nothing. Um, and then <laughs> Chef and Puppet. Um, I say retro because I think it's a bit of an anti-pattern that you need an agent on a server to provision it. It's a bit chicken and the egg. Um, my favorite is Ansible. Um, <coughs> nice thing about Ansible is it requires no agent because it's pure SSH based. Um, it's got lots of modules um, and it uses YAML based configuration. Um, and you basically set up these YAML based playbooks. You have playbooks of playbooks. Um, let me show you one of these. This is one that I did, I think, on Tuesday. Um, set up that an SSH key is already on DigitalOcean. I don't know if you, people have used DigitalOcean. It's quite cheap and quite good for setting up an idea. Um, I use them all the time. Fire up an instance, play around, bring them back down. I don't know, 10 bucks for five servers for a month. I don't, I don't work for them, sorry. I'm not on commission, so we'll move on. Um, so I set this all up, and then off we go. Um, and that's basically what a command looks like. Now, going back to the talk this morning about Twig, I'd like to say, first off, that I didn't find it boring. However, I did have a few seconds. So what I thought I would do is demonstrate how easy it is. <laughs> so okay. I run Ansible. And there's my control panel in there. And then suddenly there are five servers. Okay. That's nice. I can live with that. They didn't exist. There was no trickery there. Um, that's nice. That's the way that things should go. Um, so we talk a bit about configuration, because that's the other side of provisioning. It's not so much just, okay, fine, we've got new servers and they've got Nginx on them. We've got an application. Um, hopefully we've got an application. Now, you see this all the time. This is site's default settings of PHP. And actually, Drupal itself has a build step. This gets populated as part of your build. That's fine if we were going to do an installation every single time we deploy. Um, I, yeah, it's all right, but fine. It's not really going the right way. Um, specifically, there's a very good website called the 12 Factor App. 12 Factor App has this to say about configuration. A litmus test for whether an app has all config correctly factored out of the code is whether the code base could be made open source at any moment without compromising any credentials, which is just not simply true in that first example. Um, so how does 12 Factor App recommend it? Just quickly, so does that, that's not saying though, it's a true litmus test in the sense that if it passes that test, it's configured correctly. That's saying that if it doesn't pass the test, it's triggered. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a prereq, um, not a uh, sign off. Um, 12 factor app stores config environment variables. Envars are easy to change between deploys without changing any code. So, how would that look? Um, well, this is yeah, in PHP FPM, you have pools, and you can tag on at the end envars. So this is out, not even in your doc group, this is completely outside. Um, you can put this in, db name, db host, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> there we go. And that will work on your sandbox, staging server, wherever you like. Just as an aside, that's what Angular does. 
Yes. Yes, sorry, yeah. Yeah. It's not the only way to use Ansible. Although, if everybody uses Ansible, that would be really good. Just, just in fact, forget everything else, just do Ansible. Um, provisioning, though, is a mindset. I said before, I don't mind bash scripts because I think people are going in the right direction. They're at least trying to record what they're doing. Um, you should try to just make sure that you can run the same deploy again and again, and it works. Um, part of that is you provision everything the same way. You don't go, oh, well, we provision live using Puppet, but actually it's a bit hard to do that for our Vagrant box for some reason, so we have a bash script. Stop there. Um, you also find that sometimes there's this, this step, you go, oh, you know, half of it is in Chef or whatever, and then I just do these extra steps. Well, make the time, please, to go and put them all in there. Um, and get into a workflow of automation. The way that I work when I'm on a website, I will start installing stuff, and I will take that command and put it into uh, Sublime. And I will go through, and then I will destroy that instance, and then I will run that as a source. Does it work? Yes. Now it's time to go and make it into a proper provisioning uh, script. Um, but that's a mindset, because we wouldn't necessarily do that when it comes to code. Um, okay, so Ansible solving some problems. In fact, all of these are solving problems. Um, but we still have a few nice toys out there. One of my favorite toys at the moment is Docker. Um, how to describe Docker? Um, it's a lightweight Linux container. First off, who's heard of Docker? Oh, fantastic. Okay, right. So it doesn't need so much introduction. Um, so it's a portable environment. It has a Git-like interface of how you move stuff. Docker push, Docker pull, Docker commit. Um, and um, what, what's this solving for us? Well, th there's this situation uh, I've actually encountered. It's not hypothetical. Um, there's a bug. The bug requires that actually a new extension is installed, a Peckle instead. So now you have a situation where a developer is installing Peckle locally, solves the, you know, a Peckle extension and it solves the problem. Now how do we get that back out onto the server? Well, that could be deploy, but is it the right version? Well, the, is it in the right repo? Oh no, I had to go and use this extremely weird one and that solved it. Um, that can be a bit of a bind to do. Um, with a container, it's effectively a VM within a VM. That's a, a mindset to, to take. That, so you can install into that container your dependencies, push it, and use that same container on live. Um, and then just ship it straight out. So here is a little video I did. Again, I quite like my videos. Um, so go into my Vagrant box. As you can see, I'm on 13.10, Ubuntu. Now it's a shipping container. It can have anything in it I want. I've pulled down the CentOS one. So wait, I'm on Ubuntu and I'm running Yum? Mind blown! First time. <laughs> yeah. Although I don't like how slow Yum is, but yeah. Um, so, yeah, it took a while. So anyhow. Um, it's not without problems. Um, it's very new. So I think it's 0.7 at the moment, possibly 0.8. Um, uh, it, because it runs, it essentially runs as an executable. Out, or all of the documentation supports this. So actually getting it to run as a daemon with all multiple daemons within it is not as easy as we would like yet. Um, the worst thing, though, is it runs as root on your box. <laughs> Don't run as root. Um, but that's been fixed. Um, okay, so, and we're done, guys. So, um, I think it's time for questions. No questions? That's, yes, sir. 
Okay. Right. Have you identified your bottleneck? No. Okay. So I think actually the first thing is before solving the problem is solve the problem above it, which is logging um, and profiling. Um, I'd assume with the number of users you have, more than one server on one of them, turn on xxprof, take a look at that, take a look at your slow query logs, um, identify where the problem is first before trying to solve the problem. And I would say log that. Yes, sir, you had a question. Yeah. Um, first, first question is, uh, do you have a way to do a full pay availability uh, solution Mm -hmm. um, how do you do um, remote execution like, without having to do it or stuff like that? Um, how do you scale your infrastructure and your auto auto scaling is, system? So the question is about auto-scaling. Um, well, so at the moment actually we do, we do have a auto-scaling solution uh, for one of our customers. It's not ideal um, and we're doing a bit more with it but there's effectively a deploy server within the infrastructure that has uh, Ansible running on it so it can then fire up additional servers as necessary and it works on a system of load as a baseline we'd like to make it cleverer because it has sometimes false positives um, but it simply goes alright well I'm seeing 70% across 5 time to fire up 2 more it is at the moment. There's more research going into it, but yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, I'm using Doctrine Interruption, and if so, what problems have you solved with it? Are we using Doctrine in Drupal 8? Docker. 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 Um, there is one customer who is using Docker. I'm not on that team, but it is solving the problem... They're, they're sort of trialling as much as anything. It is solving the fact that they like to do lots of deploys. They are, um, they're a big e-commerce company. It's not actually a Drupal um, project. It's a Magento project. Um, they like to do lots and lots of updates regularly. Um, some of these are changing the infrastructure. Docker is solving a problem with them and the way that they work. Um, I don't have an answer for you on the Drupal side yet. Just one, uh, just one minute. Yes, sir. I followed your uh, guide on story measure messaging. Was I generally good? What would you recommend for that like, flavor of data? Very nice system in your ADB. My personal, uh, well, um, I was, I actually ripped it from the talk because I was going to run out of time. But there's, um, there's a layer called tungsten, which is a, um, it's really helping with certainly the case of Magento, which doesn't scale very well. Magento. Yeah, exactly. But um, the the fact is that MySQL itself is not great at scaling, um, and any flavour of that is going to have some problems with, along with that. Um, so uh, we use Tungsten to get around that problem, which is basically a, a client in front of MySQL, uh, load balancing essentially across there. Um, on the subject of, uh, well, Drupal 8 allows you to actually abstract away, so if you're going to go to doctrine, doctrine and you write your entities correctly, there are the possibilities to move to anything that doctrine will support. Um, I have an idea to actually see how true that is with Mongo, because I quite like Mongo. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Yes, sir? Um, all of the examples that you gave were all about um, provisioning data onto a, an operating system that already exists. Have you got any, any recommendations for provisioning an operating system Well, with DigitalOcean, those servers didn't exist at all. But they are, they are a known image. Um, in the case of your data, 
whereby um, one of the things that I'm working out with Mike Simons, who I don't know if you know him, he's, he's very good at DevOps as well. Um, he, the idea is that you have basically your persistency on the NFS and you connect that up as necessary and then you can, you can also share that, that well, you, however you wish to move your, your persistency around but then you connect up to your network services on the new bare metal. Um, on bare metal itself, Ansible is fine if you have SSH, you just have to start up, but I don't have a, an answer on the actual imaging because I try to use uh, hypervised uh, solutions wherever possible. Okay, I'm looking at the time and I think that's it. So I'd like to say thank you very much. Thank you.